hello hello welcome it's three o'clock we'll be kicking off so welcome everybody uh, this is the behavioral insights team webinar on crafting effective communications during a crisis my name is hugo harper and i'm the covid 19 director at the behavioral insights team i'm joined today by a number of colleagues from across the team hannah and abby who work in the london office with me and michael who works in our new york office over the past three months We've been advising governments and public bodies on how to apply behavioural science to improve the effectiveness of COVID-19 communications. Today, we'll talk you through some of our work thus far and discuss what we've learned about improving COVID-19 related communications. The aim of this webinar is to provide you with some practical tips and help you apply behavioural insights to your own communications in the fight against COVID-19. For this webinar, we're going to be using Slido to take questions throughout. Uh, to ask a question, go to slido.com and use the code M593. You should be able to see that in the top right hand screen, top right hand of your screen. We'll pause to go through uh, some of these questions at different points during the webinar, about halfway through and at the uh, end of it. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to my colleague Hannah, who's going to give us an overview of COVID-19 and try to explain why human behaviour change is so central to the fight against COVID-19. Thanks, Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah Bird and I'm a Principal Advisor at the Behavioural Insights Team's Office in London. I've been closely involved in our work supporting the Cabinet Office, Department of Health and Social Care and the NHS in their response to COVID-19. I'm going to kick us off by giving you a quick overview of the pandemic we're currently facing, as if you needed a reminder. As of this morning, there were over 3 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 and over 200,000 confirmed deaths from, from COVID-19. Cases have now been reported in 185 countries and regions around the world. What started with an outbreak in the Hubei province of China at the end of December 2019 is now a global pandemic. In order to bring the pandemic under control, governments across the globe have introduced unprecedented measures affecting public and economic life. Many governments have introduced lockdown regimes, although with great diversity in degrees of severity. These lockdowns have imposed restrictions on people's freedoms, limiting how far they can travel, how often they can leave their homes and who they see. The animated map from the FT that you see here highlights the various levels of lockdown that have been introduced across the globe since the first lockdown was seen in Wuhan in January. After an initial strong surge in cases across Asia, Europe and North America, many countries in these regions now seem to be approaching the coveted flattened curve, achieving a plateau and in some cases even a reduction in the number of new cases. However, many countries are still seeing cases grow day by day and there are many low and middle income countries that may soon see a growth in the number of cases. In the following section, I'm going to explain why COVID-19 is ultimately a behavioural problem, the behaviours we need to focus on changing and how we might identify some of the barriers that are preventing the behaviours that we want to see. As I'm sure you're all aware, there is currently no treatment or vaccine available for COVID-19 and current research suggests that a vaccine is about a year to a year and a half away. Because there is no vaccine, the only way to stop COVID-19 is to prevent transmission, which relies on a change in people's behaviours. Human behaviours have a central role in reducing transmission. As behavioural scientists, we find it useful to try to identify the specific behaviours in question. To stop the spread, we are relying on both infected and uninfected people to stay at home as much as possible, to keep a safe distance from each other when out getting essential items and indeed within their homes in certain cases, to wash their hands effectively and frequently, to cough into their elbows rather than their hands, to clean surfaces frequently and to wear protective clothing including masks in some cases. Some of these behaviours may seem slightly less relevant now that many countries are in lockdown and the key behaviour people need to adopt is to stay at home. However, they will become really crucial again once lockdowns are lifted. Additional behaviours may become important too, such as using apps for symptom tracking, distancing when we return to work and so on. For some of these behaviours, such as hand washing, we're asking people to build on existing habits. Other behaviours such as social distancing will be totally new to many people. 
If we want to change people's behaviour, we need to understand what barriers might exist that get in the way of them carrying out their behaviour. Researchers at University College London developed a very useful behaviour change model called COMB. Some of you will be familiar with this already. COMB can be used to identify and categorise barriers to behaviours. The model states that in order for a behaviour to occur, people need to have the capability, opportunity and motivation to do it. Let's look at some of the potential behavioural barriers to hand washing to illustrate this. If we take capability first, there may be a number of barriers. People may not know how to wash their hands properly. They particularly might not understand the importance of washing their hands for 20 seconds and of using soap to kill the virus. Additionally, they may not remember to wash their hands in this particular way, or they may think that they are already doing it correctly. Then if we look at barriers related to opportunity, soap and sanitising supplies may not be available in the moment when people are washing their hands. Finally, looking at motivation to wash your hands. Potential barriers might involve people's beliefs about the consequences of hand washing. They may not believe that, hand wa that washing their hands will actually prevent them from catching the virus, or they might think that they will not be too badly affected if they do catch it. We have built on the UCL's team's work to create a really user-friendly tool to work through the COMB method. You can use our online barrier identification tool to identify barriers to the behaviour you're trying to change through your communications. This tool will be available on our website for you to use from next week. I'm now going to pass on to my colleague, Dr. Abby Mottishaw, to talk about using communications to drive behavioural change. Thanks, Hannah. Hi everyone, my name's Abby and I'm the online experiments lead at BIT. Before I start, I just want to remind you that you can ask questions through slido.com using the code on all of the slides, so it's M593. So today I'm going to talk to you about how communication campaigns can inform um, the fight against COVID-19. I'm going to talk to you how, about how we've been testing communication campaigns and about what we've found. First, I'm going to start to, um, telling you about how communication campaigns can play a role in the fight against COVID-19. So governments across the globe have been using communication campaigns to fight behaviour change and, and reduce the transmission of COVID-19. Communication campaigns can be a really powerful tool to drive behaviour change, but they're even more powerful when they're focused on behavioural science research. One of the first things that was tested in this pandemic was how to, hand, how to wash your hands. Governments were trying really hard to get people to wash their hands more often, to know when to wash their hands and to know how to wash their hands correctly. At BIT, we tested five different posters on how to wash, seven different posters on how to wash your hands. They are from the UK, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Spain, Italy, and the World Health Organization. And we tested these posters with over 3,000 people in the UK because we wanted to know which posters performed best with the UK audience. We were trying to identify the key principles in the posters that, were, that made them the best posters across the ones that we tested. Before we tested the posters, we moved all the logos and the brands so that there wasn't any brand recognition. And we translated those posters that weren't in English. So the ones from Spain, Italy and Taiwan. Three of the posters did particularly well, and you can see these on the slide here. So they did well in terms of recall, getting participants to understand the main messages. They were positively viewed by the participants. And when participants had seen these posters, they were more likely to say they intended to wash their hands properly. You can see that all three posters use bright infographics, um, use minimal text, and have a, a clear step-by-step -step procedure displayed on them. I'm now going to talk to you about how we've been rapidly testing communica communication campaigns online. This involves designing a poster, designing different variations of that poster, testing these variations in an online environment, and then feeding back the results from our experiments to, online, to policymakers. Doing these tests online for communication campaigns is a really effective way of testing them. 
It's even more effective at the moment when field trials just aren't possible. Online experiments are often a lot cheaper than doing field trials, which means that often we can test more ideas in online trials than we could in the field. At VIT, we use Predictive, which is our online experimentation platform, to test what works in terms of changing behaviour. We've been testing communication campaigns of COVID-19 with real participants in an online environment. To date, we've tested around 30 different communication campaigns on COVID-19. And to do this, we use large representative samples from the country that we're interested in. So for example, we've used so far about 30,000 participants from the UK and about 15,000 participants from the US. And we collect information on demographic characteristics, such as age, gender, and location. And this means that we can see which communications do best with different demographic groups, which I'll talk more about later. Predictive has a technical capability to test different kinds of communications. So for example, this is text, audio, or graphics. And because it's a, a sophisticated online environment, we can simulate things. So we can mock up a website or a mobile phone app and make the decision environment as realistic as possible. Predictive is based on the methodology of randomized control trials. This is similar to A-B testing in businesses. Randomized control trials are considered the gold standard in research because they allow us to establish causation. This means that any differences we see between the posters that we're testing has to be because of the difference between the posters because that's the only thing that we're changing. In Predictive, we have a really experienced research team that can take the data and rapidly analyze it to make sure that we can inform communications in terms of the messaging, the language, and the design that's being used. Most of our predictive experiments on COVID-19 have run within a week, which means that we can rapidly inform the key decisions that, be, that are being made in government. There's a, four key outcomes that we test in our COVID-19 experiments. The first is recall. So what is the main message? Do people understand that the poster is about washing your hands, for example? The second thing is understanding, which is comprehension. Do people understand the messages and do they, can they apply these messages to different scenarios? The third is behavioral intent. This is basically where people state whether they would do the, the behavior that we want them to do. We can use this to maybe identify the barriers that might prevent them from doing the behavior. And the fourth is sentiment. So do, how does the poster make people feel? Do they think the poster is credible or do they think the poster is easy to understand? On this slide, I'm going to talk you through the design of most of our typical COVID-19 trials. So we start with a representative sample from the country of interest. And then we randomize them to see different versions of a poster or a communications material. So here you can see the gray, the first one is in gray, and that would represent the control or the business as usual. This is basically the typical poster that will be going out as a communication. Then you can see five alternative versions here, and that would be different designs that we want to test against the control version. Because there's six different arms here, this is known as a six arm trial. We'd want at least 500 people to see each version of those materials. So here, so here you can see that there'd be 3,000 people in the experiment in total. Participants can look at the communication material for the, as long as they wish. And after they've seen the material, we then ask them questions. The first question that we ask is normally recall. So do they remember that the poster was about washing their hands? Or did they think it was about perhaps um, keeping up to date with the news or wearing a face mask. We then ask them about their behavioral intent. Then we show them the poster again, or whatever the guidance is, and we ask them set of sentiment questions. So does this poster make you feel that the government is taking the COVID-19 pandemic seriously? We then ask for free text feedback. So we ask participants whether they've got anything else that they'd like to tell us about how they feel towards the poster or any advice they've got. And finally, we ask them about demographic characteristics, such as age, gender, or education. We then decide 
which is the best performing poster based on the outcomes we were interested in. Most of the time, we, we rate um, recall as more important than anything else, followed by behavioural intent, followed by um, sentiment. And we can use this weight, these weight, a weighting system to weight these differences appropriately and then come up with a top performing poster out of the communications that we've shown. Any, thank you. Uh, so this is an example from the Department of Health and Social Care. We worked with the Department of Health and Social Care from the start of the pandemic, so way back at the start, um, mid-February. And we worked with them on um, posters to do with self-isolation and hand washing. And we worked in collaboration with the Department of Health. So we co-designed the posters and iteratively tested them. Unpredicted, we tested the posters with about 12,000 um, adults from the UK in total. And we were running our predictive experiments in parallel with the Department of Health running focus groups. So what we could do was continuously improve the poster, test a poster both quantitatively and qualitatively, improve the poster based on those results, and then test the poster again. This iterative pro process that you can see in the slide here took place over four days. And in the space of that four days, we, did, we ran three predictive experiments. I think the Department of Health also ran four focus groups. From the first row in the table, you can see that from the 27th of February, the proportion of people that recalled washing, um, that the poster was about washing your hands more often was 85%. And by the third iteration on the 1st of March, this was up to 96%. And similarly for um, recalling that the poster told you to wash your hands for 20 seconds, this was just under 50% on the 27th of March, at uh, 27th of Feb and went up to 58% by the 1st of March. So this is quite a big jump in the space of a few days, but it's still not great because just less than two in three people know that the poster was asking you to wash your hands for 20 seconds. And you can see on the final row, the intent to wash your hands more often stayed about the same, around seven in 10 people. The poster that you can see now is the final poster that the Department of Health launched towards the start of March. And you, you, if you're in the UK or you've traveled in the UK, you might have seen this poster. It was in a lot of public transport places, such as airports and tube stations, and it was also in hospitals. You can see from this final poster the, that it's much clearer to see wash your hands more often and for 20 seconds. And that was based on the research that we found, that washing your hands for 20 seconds wasn't recalled that much on the 1st of March. So this slide shows some of the qualitative feedback that we tend to get on predictors. This is an example from the How to Wash Your Hands communication campaign that we did with the Department of Health. And we can use this qualitative feedback to try to speed back the iteration process. You can see that some of the information here um, that participants have given us is about, they want to know more about how to greet people. Should we still be shaking hands, for example? And this adds flavor to the quantitative numbers that we get out of predictive, and it can help us inform future communications. So now I'm going to talk to you about some patterns that we've found across our trials. Because of the volume of the tests that we've been able to do, we've been able to look for consistent patterns. We did this a couple of weeks ago, where we could look for patterns across 11 of our COVID-19 trials, which involved more than 20,000 people in the UK. Looking for consistent patterns across multiple trials is known as a meta-analysis. The key point of this meta-analysis was to see if we could find differences across different demographic groups in terms of recall and behavioural intent. If we could identify which demographic groups don't perform as well on recall and intent as other demographic groups, then we, can, we know where to target future communication campaigns and hopefully help to slow the rate of infection. To be able to compare these findings across multiple trials, we had to create a composite score 
A composite score is a bit like an exam score. It's the percentage of questions that a participant got right in any given trial. On this slide, you can see the results for recall. So on the x-axis, you've got recall score showed as the percentage of questions answered correctly across different trials. This graph shows the findings from 11 different trials, but you can see we've grouped them into three different types of guidance. So the first is social distancing, then there's self-isolation, and then there's hand washing. And you can see in this graph that people did better at recalling um, the communication about social distancing, which is shown by the pink area on the graph being further to the right hand side. They did better at recalling social distancing compared to self-isolation and hand washing. And this is good to know because it lets us understand what people struggle with and where we can perhaps focus future communication campaigns. And this graph also tells us about recall. So along the x-axis, we have age divided into different groups that we tested. And on the y-axis, you can see recall score out of a total of 100%. And you can see um, men are shown in blue bars and women are shown in grey bars. And across the trials, you can see that younger people, and especially men, struggle to recall the content. And there's different things that might account for this. One thing that we think could account for this is the amount of time spent engaging with the materials. Almost a third of, of people in our sample, aged 18 to 24, spent less than seven seconds interacting with the material that we showed them, so whether that was a poster or longer guidance. This compares to about 13 seconds in those aged over 25. So perhaps the amount of time spent engaging with the material could explain this difference. This could be because younger people aren't used to engaging with communications in a long form, such as a poster. And perhaps they're more used to taking in information in tweets, GIFs, or videos. A second explanation could be that younger people just aren't as interested in the COVID-19 pandemic and aren't as engaged as older people. This graph is similar to the one you've just seen. But instead of looking at recall, it's looking at differences in behavioral intent. So that's the proportion of people that say they definitely intend to do the thing that the communication is asking them to do. And you can see again that younger people report lower intent to stick to the guidance, as do men across all ages, apart from the 70 plus group where the gender differences seem to balance out. And again, the reasons for, the reasons for this, um, could be that younger people perhaps worry less about COVID-19 compared to older people. So this could mean that they have apathy towards the guidance. But we've collected data on worry, and we don't think that this is the case. A second reason could be overconfidence. So perhaps younger people think they understand the information and know what the posters say without actually reading it properly. Whatever the reason, this shows that we might need additional strategies to target younger people and especially men in order to get them to comply with the guidance. And this is something the government should take seriously. There's 7.4 million people in the UK that are male aged 18 to 24. So this is a large group of participants of the population that isn't complying exactly with the guidance that that the government's putting out. And the final graph that I want to show you is about worry. And this is really quite exciting because we haven't shared all of this data with anybody yet. So this graph shows all the data we've collected on worry since February up until last week. In all of the COVID-19 communications that we've tested, we've also asked participants how worried do they feel about coronavirus? And what do they think their personal chances of getting COVID-19 um, COVID in 2020, so in the next year? Along the x-axis, you can see time going from 
February when we first started collecting data all the way until last week. And on the y-axis on the left hand side, you can see the percentage of respondents who were very or extremely worried about coronavirus. And then on the y-axis on the right hand side, you can see the total confirmed cases in England. And that refers to the green line on the graph, which is a cu the cumulative amount of COVID-19 cases in England. And you can see that worry varies across different groups. So here we're showing age. So towards the start of the pandemic, people were quite similar. Then towards mid-March, you can see those over 25 started to worry about COVID-19 much more than those aged 18 to 25. We can also see a peak. The peak in all ages is just after lockdown was announced. So lockdown was announced on the 23rd of March, and that was a Monday, and we next collected, collected data the following weekend, and you can see that peak there. Since that, we've collected data at three more points across lockdown. And you can see that for those aged 18 to 25, worry, the level of worry has kind of stabilized, is quite consistent. And the, and the level of worry for those aged 25 and over is slowly starting to come down. So maybe it's reaching sort of a stable um, percentage of worry. And this is interesting in itself, but we've also done some further research and we've shown that worry actually impacts engagement. So we found that those in our sample who were not at all worried or were extremely worried were much less likely to recall the guidance that, that we were showing to participants, even after controlling for demographic characteristics such as age, gender, income, location, and education. So this shows that perhaps more support is needed for those people who are not at all worried or extremely worried to help them to be able to follow the guidance. So just to wrap up, I'm going to um, summarize the findings from the meta-analysis. So the first finding, key, key insight, I guess, is um, type. So the type of guidance was important. We saw that some types of guidance did better than others. Social distancing, people tended to recall more often than the self-isolation or the hand-washing guidance. The second key insight is that younger people, and particularly men, struggled most of the time to remember the advice that we were showing them. And we think this is because they paid, they spent less time on the communication material compared to other groups. And this has implications for communication campaigns. Perhaps they need to be shorter and more engaging to really target this group of people. The third is that, again, younger people and particularly men are less likely to say they will enact the guidance. Perhaps we need to plan specific communication campaigns to target these people. The fourth, we've shown that perhaps worry is starting to stabilize in these last few weeks. But also there's less recall of the, of the guidance in those that are less worried or extremely worried, which means that we need to bear this in mind when designing future com communication campaigns. I'm now going to pass back over to Hugo to answer some of your questions in the Q&A. Everybody, thanks for all your questions so far. There have been an awful lot of them. Um, so I'm going to try to I'm going to try to answer some of the themes that have been coming through in some of the questions rather than necessarily specific questions uh, because there have been 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 an awful lot. I think I'm going to I'm going to concentrate on two different areas where I've seen lots of questions. One, uh, the first one is about the sample that we use and whether that's representative. So there are a couple of different points here. One, we like to use large samples in this. As, as Abby mentioned, we're looking at roughly 500 people per different version of a test that we're using. Uh, this can go up or down depending on the exact accuracy of the test that we're interested in. And we make sure that the sample that we're using is balanced in terms of demographics that you'd be interested in. So for example, when we're doing work in the UK, as this work has been, we'd be looking for a sample that is has the same gender split, has the same age split as the UK, has the same split of ethnicities, for example, so that the population 
we're doing this test on is as representative as possible as the UK population. It's fair to say there are a couple of caveats with that. Right? So we are using an online platform. So that does mean that everyone who is using this online platform is, is au fait with technology in some way. Uh, so that, that's potentially a slight limitation of it. But on observable demographics that we're able to collect, we are able to create a sample that is representative across those demographics. And this is a, this is a slightly different way of doing it from sort of taking a sample and then upweighting it depending on the different demographics that you've, you've brought in. Instead, we, we, we recruit people who match the demographics that we want. Those are the people that we led into the experiment. Uh, so that's, that's the first question uh, that came up. Abby, do you have anything to add to that about the sample? No, I think that was a great summary. So yeah, we collect, we set quotas so that we can collect the right amount of people so that they're representative on terms of age, gender, income and location of the population that we're interested in. So whether that is just England or the UK or different um, places in the US. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about some of the work in the US uh, in the second half. Uh, the webinar. Uh, the other question that came up, lots of sort of different ways of asking this, is how well these things translate into real behaviours, and you know whether we think that this this will translate perfectly. And, and I think it's it's fair to say we we fully acknowledge the intention action gap. Right, just because people say they will do something doesn't make us think that they definitely will do it. Uh, however, in lots of these tests, we're comparing different versions of a communication against each other, and we're what we're saying is that. We think the one that does best is likely to do best in the real world. So if let's say that the best performing one is says 90% of people will do it, we're not sure that 90% of people will, will do it. But what we are reasonably sure of is the version that performs best, and that if that's 90% compared to 80%, compared to 70%, is likely to be the best performer in the real, real world. That's sort of the research assumption that we're making in the translation of this. And so we're making ordinal comparisons about which communication you should be choosing when you're when you're going out. Of course, where possible, it's it's great to try to get some real world data to back this up. Actually, a lot of the work that we do uh, when we've got more more time is around field RCTs, randomized control trials, so testing these things in the real world. And uh, I think there was there was also a comment about you know have have we been testing these versions on live social media? Uh, that that hasn't been something we've been involved in. That that may be something that people have been doing as as part of other communication strategies. But given the Given the fast paced nature of this, a lot of the questions around, you know, how do you, can you turn things around that quickly? I mean, as you will have seen in some of the dates, we were able to turn around some of these results in the UK, you know, within a couple of days. Um, and that means that we're testing in a non live environment. So we're using the sample that we've got uh, and looking at intentions because we think that we think that's better than nothing in the timeframes. We think it's a, it's a really good way to first order test, but we're, we're not confident that anything that we see in terms of stated intention would translate into real behavior. So I think that's uh, that's probably enough uh, of the questions now. We, just as a reminder to everybody, you can ask questions uh, on using Slido. The code will be in the top right hand corner of the screen when we return to the slides. Uh, I'm now going to pass you back over to my colleague Hannah to talk a little bit about text messaging and how we can support the most vulnerable people. Thank you, Hugo. Yes. So. A reminder, go to slido.com, uh, go to uh, the code hashtag M5N3, the, uh, 93 that you see at the top there, and you can uh, chuck us some more questions in this second half of the webinar. In this next section, I'll be talking you through how we went about writing text messages for large numbers of the UK population. Over the last month or so, we've been working with NHSX, who are a unit within the NHS driving the digital transformation of NHS services. NHSX asked us to, de to design personalised text messages to send to two different groups of people. The first group included those at high risk if they catch COVID-19 because of underlying health conditions. And the second included those who have developed symptoms of COVID-19 and need to self-isolate. I'd like to talk you through our process. So when preparing to communicate with people, it was vital to put ourselves into the shoes of the recipients as best we could. Again, appreciating we worked incredibly quickly on this um, and, and couldn't always imagine ourselves into the shoes of the recipients um, at, at, in a ways we might have had we had a bit more time. Nonetheless, we started by checking whether people even wanted to receive advice directly into the phones in their pockets. 
Again, using our online platform predictive, we added a survey question to one of our trials and we surveyed over, uh, over 600 people and found that more than 85% were keen to receive texts from the NHS. 60% were happy to get messages at least once every other day. To account for the minority who did not support this channel of communication, an opt-out was included in every message. But we were quite confident that for the majority of people, they wouldn't mind receiving a text message with advice in it from the NHS. Our approach to designing the text messages themselves drew on four main principles. First, we were sure to provide information about why the vulnerable person in particular was being asked to stay at home for 12 weeks. Recent studies into the psychological impact of quarantine that we rapidly sought out as we approach this challenge showed that providing a clear rationale for isolation measures can protect mental health and well-being. And we knew it would be important to protect those really key aspects of health once someone's physical health was provided for. We also know that social commitment and accountability can play a big part in encouraging a given behaviour. Therefore, we leverage these techniques to encourage people to stay at home. The text messages prompted recipients to establish a social commitment by letting friends or family know that they are following NHS 111 advice to stay at home. You can see an example of this here, where the recipient is encouraged to tell a family member that they are following the advice. Next up, we drew on research that suggests that planning and chunking time can ease anxiety during stressful periods and health emergencies. We added advice to text messages such as, try to stick as close as you can to your typical daily routine. Some people will do this naturally, but others won't necessarily. We also created moments of reward for reaching certain milestones. For example, by saying, congratulate yourself and others in your home for reaching the halfway point for example, if a household was self-isolating for 14 days. The idea was that these could motivate onward compliance for the rest of the isolation period. Finally, the SMS text sought to, over, to help overcome a potential barrier to staying inside, which is boredom. So through the final days of, of an isolation period, we think that boredom might really set in. At this stage, we emphasise the altruistic nature of self-isolation and sought to tap into pro-social motivation, whereby people can, make, can be more likely to undertake a behaviour if they think about the benefits to others rather than them, themselves. The final days of isolation may be the hardest, as most people are expected to be feeling better after day six of symptoms, yet they remain contagious for at least a further 24 hours. And it's key to stay inside for the full period to try and stop the onward spread. Throughout writing the text messages, we use the basic behavioural design principles of keeping instructions simple. This is actually the real beauty of disseminating important public health messages via text message, because you're forced to work with a short character limit. Our challenge was to distill the rapidly emerging, rapidly emerging official guidance on shielding vulnerable people, for example, which is 3,425 3, words long at the time that we were referencing it into daily short text messages of no longer than 612 characters. At a time of overwhelming change for this audience, it was also key to ensure that the bite-sized pieces of information we gave were carefully prioritised and spread thoughtfully over a seven-day period, allowing people to digest each instruction. And I should say that we weren't the only ones writing this. There was input from our colleagues at NHSX and clinical input to ensure that all the messages were safe before they were sent out to this uh, particularly vulnerable uh, group of the population. Since recalling complex information can be more difficult during times when cognitive resources and attention are stretched thinly, it was important to focus on communicating the most important information first, and that's what we did. Finally, we wanted to make use of the opportunity to get information back from the text message recipients, as well as to give information out through this channel. The best information we had at that point uh, in, in March about the progression of the disease, we knew that day six was typically the day when people would be turning a corner, either to start to properly recover or to need more specialist healthcare support. For the healthcare system to be able to plan ahead for this demand, we therefore started to ask people how they're doing on day six. This so-called symptom check message signpost people to more care if needed. 
This data capture also helps acute services plan demand for the coming couple of days. We had to work really quickly with our colleagues uh, in NHSX and uh, the NHS BSA to, quit, to set up this service. Without time to thoroughly test and co-design the content with the target audiences as we usually would. Instead, we made the most of a new data set which grew quickly once the SMS started going out. The text message recipients were occasionally replying to the SMS they were, they were receiving. We were clear that they, they wouldn't get clinical support by replying. Some were replying nonetheless, and often, often without health-related questions. In fact, the vast majority without health-related questions, as you'll be reassured to hear. By the end of the first week, over 7 million texts had been sent out, 41,000 individual text responses had come back. We didn't want to waste this important source of information about how the people were receiving the messages and any follow on questions that they had. At the end of the first week, we therefore quickly analysed the responses from the vulnerable cohort. On this graph, you can see various different categories of responses along the x axis and the percentage of all messages within that category on the y axis. We use sentiment analysis to analyze the responses, a technique that combines qualitative and quantitative method methods to classify the sentiment within text data as positive, negative, or neutral. This approach is a good way of analyzing a large number, like thousands of responses. It allows you to get a good high level understanding of whether the content is generally well received or needs a lot of improvement. It must be noted, however, that the speed with which we performed this analysis meant that quite a large number of responses that you can see on the far left there remained uncategorized. What we found from the remaining roughly 21,000 responses was promising. In general, twice as many of the responses from those in the vulnerable group expressed positive sentiments or a thank you compared to negative ones or concerns. The largest categories of response other than the unca uncategorized that I mentioned were thanks and practical questions. You can see some examples of the messages we received under different categories on the slide. I'll just pause for a moment so that you can take those in. We then use this feedback to iterate and improve the text messages, adding more information about discussing the situation with an employer, for example, and clarifying that staying at home means staying within your property's perimeter. This helped to deal with uncertainty people had about going into their gardens, for example, which is likely to be low risk versus taking rubbish out to communal bins on the street, which could put this group at higher risk. And indeed, we added more information about um, receiving um, typical NHS health services, such as medication deliveries direct to, uh, to the vulnerable person's door. Lots of these services were coming online at the time, and this was a way that we could communicate about those as well. Again, with that important character count and simplicity of message in mind, we could not go into details, however, about people's various living circumstances. The nation lives in such an array of accommodation, ranging from estate blocks to landed estates. We had to write with the widest possible diversity of people in mind, and truthfully, people self-isolating in tower blocks were at the forefront of our minds as we wrote these. These new and improved messages then gave clear directions to a further 400,000 people who were identified uh, as vulnerable the following week. This project has been a great opportunity to apply the expertise we've built in the team since its early days about encouraging well-being and public health behaviours to a practical and urgent policy challenge. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Michael in New York to tell you what has been keeping them very busy over there. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Kamick. I'm a senior advisor at Bit North America in our New York office, where I've been involved with helping cities across the U.S. Um, in their COVID-19 response as a partner in Bloomberg Philanthropy's What Works Cities initiative. Uh, what Works Cities supports local governments to use data and evidence you know, more effectively to improve residents' lives and tackle pressing challenges. And um, throughout our work with governments on COVID-19 communications, we start from the behavioral science literature to design our messages. After many tests, uh, we found some kind of key behavioral principles that you can use to make your communications more effective. Uh, and I'd like to share those principles with you now. 
So I'm going to introduce you to five key behavioral principles in total that you can use to improve your communications using examples from a selection of our work uh, on communications with the UK government, as well as US cities, including Portland, Oregon, Newark, Kansas City, and Fayetteville. I'll also discuss some additional principles that merit further testing. So first, uh, the first principle is reducing cognitive load by keeping messages simple. So the total amount of effort that is used in a person's working memory is also known as cognitive load. Cognitive load is a limited resource. You know, people lead busy lives. Their cognitive load is usually high. If you want them to understand and act on a communication, it's crucial that we reduce the cognitive load of messages by making them as clear and easy to understand as possible. So be clear when things are of equal importance. For example, stay home and contact 111. Um, avoid using complex words or jargon in your communications. So when we see a word or phrase that we don't understand, we're more likely to sort of give up trying to understand what the message is actually asking us to do. Uh, it can be sometimes hard to spot jargon. You can address this by asking a family member, such a parent or partner, uh, to read and explain your message to you and see if they sort of repeat back to you what you're intending them to pick up from the message. So we must, uh, our work with the city of Fayetteville and San Jose in the US uh, and with the NHS in the UK found that simplified messages were more effective drivers of behavior change. So first, keep your messages simple. Second principle is put key information at the top. So we found that the way that you present the hierarchy of information you're trying to communicate affects recall. Um, and people often will only spend fractions of a second looking at your communications. If the aim of the communication is to change behavior, it's absolutely vital that you put the key action you want people to take at the top in large letters. You want it to be really salient. So take the example of the UK government's poster seen here, encouraging folks to wash their hands. This was a key behavior the government wanted to encourage in the early stages of the pandemic. And, and the Department of Health and Social Care approached us with this an initial draft on the left. And through a series of tests, uh, we iterated to arrive at the version on the right-hand side, which was found to be more effective at changing behavioral intent. So this principle um, of putting key information at the top uh, applies to letters and emails too. Any communication where you want people to take action, have it at the top immediately visible and salient. So the next principle is keep messages short. So the shorter you can keep your messages, the better. Um, do what you can to kind of reduce the amount of text in your communications so that you keep the focus on your main message. That means removing all non-essential content. Uh, the less text there is, the easier it will be for people to understand and actually focus on what you want them to do. So you can shorten text by providing links to helpful but non-essential information. Uh, and by using bullet points or tables to sort of break up blocks of text. We found shortening uh, the text uh, led to improved form performance in the UK hand washing poster. So even a, a difference of like, you know, going from 34 to or 52 to 34 awards made a difference. And we've also built on this work in the US and designed a, a poster uh, focused on encouraging people in San Jose to stay home with a very limited word count to begin with. So we're able to build on, on some of our early work. Um, when you're shortening text though, be sure not to miss out on crucial information. So in this example, wash your hands would not have been specific enough uh, and we wanted to be specific. So we told them to wash their hands for 20 seconds. Okay, the fourth principle is add an infographic or simple image. Um, Adding an infographic or image that re reinforces your message can help make information more accessible. Uh, in our work with Portland, so the, the yellow poster here seen on the right, we actually tested this image alone without text against posters with text. And this poster focuses on behavior within grocery stores. So 
people who viewed a poster with the image alone actually performed equally on recall and behavioral intent measures and actually slightly better on a few of those kind of specific sub questions. Uh, however, the image only poster performed worse on sentiment measures like this flyer makes me feel like the store is taking coronavirus seriously. So interesting results from testing there, but uh, takeaway being that a lot of times folks can get your main message from the image alone. So it's important that you have a clear and simple image. Um, as with text, they, the, the image itself has to be kind of simple, intuitive, easy to understand, and people should be able to scan it and quickly understand what it is. Um, testing on our work uh, with the UK hand washing poster shown here, we found that people didn't understand what the image was showing on the left, which was someone holding a rail uh, on public transport. Uh, so we iterated and we ended up on the image on the right, which is, I think, more intuitive, where folks were able to see that it's, a, in fact, a person kind of pushing down a, a door handle. So clear and simple images, intuitive images are important. Finally, if you have um, a process you want people to follow, consider outlining the steps of the process with images and simple text, um, like in the hand-washing posters Abby described earlier, or as you see in the Portland poster on the right, kind of, uh, along the bottom. Finally, the fifth behavioral principle really um, just goes back to testing. Uh, next slide, please. So test what works to, to get your point across. Sometimes results can be surprising. So as Abby outlined earlier, by testing and iterating the hand-washing posters, we were able to increase the recall of key messages uh, with repeated iteration across best performing posters, um, across experiments, and across qualitative focus groups, we were able to get significantly more effective final versions. For all communications you're designing and testing, ask participants, what was the main action you're being advised to do? This will help you determine if the message clearly illustrates the key action you want them to take. Second, ask them to what extent they intend to change their behavior after seeing the communication and third ask them if the information is easy to understand so now moving on i'm going to talk about a couple of principles that may merit further testing and and um, why we test even uh, strategies from our experience and the behavioral science literature because sometimes results can be surprising so we've seen local variation in how messages are interpreted. We don't always know in advance how these variations will, will you know, what they'll look like. And so that illustrates, I think, further the need for testing. For example, in Newark, New Jersey, a message which highlighted individuals' sense of duty or responsibility to others generated increased behavioral intentions to follow recommended behaviors when tested against other communications. It was seen as credible. It conveyed a sense that the city of Newark was looking out for its residents. However, this behavioral principle didn't improve the effectiveness of uh, our communications in Fayetteville, despite our predictions that it would be effective in this city with a large number of people serving in the armed forces. So this, I think, highlights the importance of testing behavioral principles, even ones that are promising in the literature in the local context. Uh, moving on, so results, another sort of example of results being surprising. So additionally, when testing communications in Fayetteville, uh, we developed two posters, one with a military message and one with a faith-focused message. Um, the idea here is we were sort of personalizing the communication or tailoring it to respond to the local context. And that's a behavioral principle we found to work well previously in, in other situations. However, in this case, the messages that performed, uh, in this case, those two messages actually performed least well when compared to messages that included the behavioral principles of social norms and simplicity. Um, again, we assessed each poster across three categories, comprehension, behavioral intent, and sentiment. On the top line of that table on the right, you can see that the communications that were simple and evoke social norms performed better in terms of recall than those that tried to evoke 
a sense of duty uh, or resonate with identity. So this just further highlights the importance of, of testing behavioral principles in the local context um, to make sure that they work. Thanks for listening. I hope, I hope those principles were useful. I'm going to now pass back to Hugo. We'll do a quick recap and lead us to the final QA. Hi, everybody. Hope, you, hope you're all still with us. Uh, well, thanks, thanks for listening to us today. I'm just going to quickly recap some of the key messages that have come across, and then I'm going to close off with some of the, it's answering some of the questions. I think we've got about five minutes left. So uh, in terms of practical tips for creating effective comms in a crisis, the first thing that you need to do is identify the key behavior that you want to change. So specifically what you want people to do, and then think about the behavioral barriers that there might be in getting people to do this. So what can you do to change people's behavior? The second step is to apply behavioral principles when you're designing these communications. Uh, I won't read out all of those examples here, but you've, you've heard about a lot of these from Abby and Michael and Hannah already. You want to keep the message short and concise. Uh, and the third step is that human behavior is really complex, right? It's really difficult to know what's going to work in any given situation. And so testing different versions and iterating as we go along is a really important thing to do. And, you know, it's the, the principle of empiricism. It's, uh, it's, it's tricky. We, we're not sure what's going to work always, and so it's best to test it wherever possible. So those are the those are the key three steps. Uh, next, I'll let's have a look at some of the questions that you've got. And there have been absolutely loads. I'm not sure if we've got a full final count yet, uh, but I've been I've been trying again to pull out some of the themes that have come across so far. We've got about three minutes, so I'll try, I'll try to answer some. Uh, one of the all themes that has come across from people saying, have there been differences by ethnicity or gender or socioeconomic status? There have been things of things of that nature. So when we're running these experiments, have we seen big differences in this group? And I think it's fair to say that whilst there are some distant differences that exist between the group, we've shown some of that to you already in terms of responses and young men seeming to not do as well on some of the recall measures. What we haven't seen a lot of evidence of is there different versions of the messages working a lot better for different groups? So the uplifts have seemed to be relatively consistent across the demographic groups that we uh, we might be interested in. That's, that's one of the questions that came through. Another question that came through was around, sort of related, is around cultural differences. So, you know, how sure would we be that these results from the UK or the US would translate to elsewhere? Uh, and I mean, that's a really complicated question. It depends how similar the context. Uh, I'd sort of refer back to one of the principles. Like we we, we always suggest testing if if we can with things, and so and also when you're designing potential interventions, try to keep cultural context in mind. Um, one of the other questions was how is this different from standard A/B testing? And here I think that hopefully the overview gives you a bit of a uh, an idea about that. Uh, as we're looking not just at running the test, but also trying to identify the specific behavior, identifying some of the barriers and potentially using the tool that will be online next week and using some principles from behavioral science. Uh, many of you followed the team's work previously, might be familiar with the EAST framework, keeping things easy, attractive, social and timely. So there are some principles of design that, that go into suggestions that we'd make, as well as the testing. But the testing is really uh, an important part. So I think I've... Uh, I've just got one uh, one minute left. I think there, there should be a final slide uh, that just says, effectively, I hope that you've all enjoyed, all enjoyed the webinar. Um, I hope you've, you've enjoyed the contact the content. Uh, obviously, communications is just one part of the effort, but we thought it was a good good thing to focus on right now. And hopefully, there have been some lessons that you've been able to take away from this. Uh, if, you, if you are interested in hearing more about this, do drop us a line. That's info at bi.team. Uh, and we try to publish as much as we can on the website and through blogs and stuff on uh, bi. Uh, BI dot team, uh, Twitter as well. Uh, so this should hopefully be one of uh, many webinars. Uh, hopefully, if you like it, please do leave feedback uh, at the end of it. Uh, sorry if I haven't been able to get to any of the some of your questions, uh, but do you know do do email the info inbox if you're interested in it. Uh, th I guess thanks again to all the presenters. Thanks to Abby. Thanks to Hannah. Thanks to Michael. Uh, I think they all did a really great, great job. Hope you all agree, uh, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye bye.